Well, welcome back to our series, Current Reality. I want to welcome our Sepulpa and Quita campuses, those of you that are watching online. We have subtitled this Current Reality series, What Do You Do When There's Nothing You Can Do? What do you do when there's nothing you you can do to fix the situation that you're in? What do you do when there's no way forward, there's no way out? What do you do when your dreams can't come true, when things aren't going to go as you planned? Sometimes things don't go as planned because of something that you did or something you do. And sometimes things don't go as planned because of something somebody else did. But regardless, you find yourself in a current reality situation. Maybe you found out the two of the two of you may not ever live happily ever after, or you may not ever get the opportunity to walk a daughter down the aisle, or you may not need to purchase a high chair. It may mean that uh, the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter, it seems, may never come home. Or your second marriage is starting to feel an awful lot like your first marriage. He's going to marry her anyway. You're not going to get into that school. It feels like the money's always going to be tight. Your dream job is never going to be an option for you. What do you do when there's nothing you can do? Sometimes it feels as if when things aren't going as we'd hope that maybe God isn't doing what he promised, that God isn't coming through, that God's not keeping up with his end of the bargain. And so we think that maybe God owes us because we lived right, because we played by the rules, because we did the right things, that God owes us, that things ought to go smoothly and wrinkle free for us. And so you feel like God maybe has let you down because life is not like that. Your dreams aren't coming true even when it seems like everybody else's are. You're in a current reality. So in week number one, we talked about this idea that God is not absent, God is not apathetic, God is not angry. We learned that from the story of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the proclaimer, the one that announced the coming of Jesus and Jesus uh, as the Messiah. But Paul, uh, John the Baptist found himself imprisoned for uh, an extended period of time. And he began to wonder. He began to, to lose faith in that. And so he sent messengers to Jesus while he's in prison and said, Are you the one or should we expect another? Jesus sent word back to him through those same messengers and said, you tell John, I'm the one that's uh, making blind eyes see, and I'm the one that's, that's uh, cleansing lepers, and I'm the one that's healing the lame, and I'm the one that's raising the dead. In other words, I am the one that you expected, but that also means, John, that I'm the one that's leaving you in prison. And ultimately, John the Baptist would die in prison. And so we talked about this idea that the presence of adversity does not equate with the absence of God. The presence of adversity does not mean that God is absent. There is not a conflict, even when we're going through plan B moments and circumstances, that we're going through those difficulties and yet God can still love us and God can still care for us. Week number two, we presented this idea that if you're a Christian, you have the option to view your current reality uh, as a gift from God, a gift with a purpose and a promise. The Apostle Paul had what he called a thorn in the flesh, and he asked God repeatedly to remove whatever that physical uh, disability was. We don't know what it was, but we know that it was uh, painful and humiliating and debilitating uh, for him. But even though he pleaded, God said no. He did not take that. In fact, God said, no, but my grace is sufficient for you. And and Paul understood that this was something he could see as a gift from God. He said, this thorn in the flesh, I was given a thorn in the flesh in order that it had purpose. There was a purpose and a promise behind it. And I love it that we're able to look back at men and women throughout scripture, the ones in fact who brought us our Bibles and the ones who passed on the faith to us, and we're able to look back and see that they were not strangers to adversity, that they did not see it as a contradiction to their faith, even though they went through difficult times. In fact, most of them did go through difficult times. And it's comforting, reassuring for me to know that, that we can look back and see people that, that experience that as we do. 
If you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to start there in verse 10, Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. And it's there that we're going to read a word that the Apostle Paul writes that, want, that is not often associated with adversity or difficulty. The word is contentment. And I love Warren Wiersbe's definition for that. He says it's an inner sufficiency that keeps us at peace in spite of outward circumstances, an inner sufficiency that allows us to be able to still be at peace in spite of outward circumstances. And so it is uh, the ability when things on the outside are chaotic and out of control, it's the ability to be at peace on the inside. Paul says that in Christ, there is a way in which you can find contentment in spite of the fact that things are out of your control. What do you do when there's nothing that you can do? Can I just remind you of the Apostle Paul's life? He grew up as a Jew. He became a prominent Pharisee. And as a part of that, he began to chase down and persecute Christians. He would round them up and put them in jail. Sometimes he would even be a part of the, the, the death or the, uh, the, the martyrdom of those, those Christians. But one day, he and Jesus met uh, after Jesus had, had already died and ascended, risen and ascended back into heaven. Uh, he had a physical encounter with Jesus, and he became a follower of Jesus. Not only that, he became an evangelist for Jesus. No longer was he persecuting Christians. He was converting people to Christianity. And then he began to plant churches, and he traveled the, 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 much of the known world. Ten years into that part of his story, though, Paul finds himself under house arrest in the capital of the Roman Empire, Rome itself. He doesn't know when his case is going to be called up. He doesn't know what's going to happen next in his life. It's likely that his life may not last much longer. And there he finds himself. And he has reason to be concerned. The emperor at this point in time is a guy named Nero. And Nero was known for his persecution of Christians. He's the one that basically started that with the Roman government. He was known for basically lighting Christians on fire to illuminate his gardens does not look good for Paul. It appears that Rome is going to win and that Jesus is going to lose, that Christianity is going to lose. It is a current reality situation. Paul finds himself chained to a guard 24-7. That's his life for two years. What's he going to do? Well, besides sharing his faith, in Jesus with this captive audience that's with him all the time and is constantly being rotated. He also decides that he'll write some letters back to some of the churches and to some of the people that he had acquainted, become acquainted with. He used this as an opportunity to encourage and strengthen and to, to lift up and to teach some of those people. In fact, he wrote four letters that we have included in our New Testament. They're Ephesians and Colossians and uh, Philippians and Philemon. They're known as the prison epistles. They're written by Paul while he was under house arrest. Little did he know that while he was writing these, that these would be included in a document that would be read for thousands and thousands of years. I mean, little did he know how he would help change the view that people had of, of Christianity and of Jesus and of God. I mean, in his mind, he's just writing uh, some stuff to encourage some people that he knew, but he wrote it to people and it's going to absolutely change uh, literature and be read here now even 2,000 years later. But what he wrote was, was written during some extraordinary adversity. The Apostle Paul had no idea what hung in the balance of his decision to continue to be faithful to Jesus in spite of his difficult uh, circumstances. And so the reason, though, that he was able to be that kind of person was, in fact, because of his adversity, because of his decision to remain faithful through that adversity. And so here's what I want to remind you. In your current reality situation, maybe it's one you're going through right now. Maybe it's going to be something that happens to you next year. But in your current reality situation, you have no idea who or what hangs in the balance of you being strong and faithful. 
It's easy for us to think, well, there's really no point in doing the right thing. There's no point in continuing. There's no point in me being obedient. There's no point in me standing strong. But it's often in the context of adversity that God does his most important work in us and through us. God is not absent. He's not apathetic. He's not angry in those moments. God is at work in us through those moments. And it's in that kind of situation that Paul writes some words like this, Philippians 4.10. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. So Paul, basically in prison, he's chained to a guard, he's under house arrest, and he's saying, I'm rejoicing in the Lord for you because you showed concern for me. Now, remember, news in that day would have traveled slowly. It might have taken weeks or months for them to hear that Paul was even in prison. And then by the time they heard the news and were able to get a care package together and send it by messenger through somebody else, in fact, we're told even who that messenger was later in this chapter, a guy named Epaphroditus. He brings this care package and it just takes a while for those things. And so the apostle Paul is not irritated with that. He's like, I'm glad you finally have some, some reason to be uh, generous and to care for me in this way. And uh, we maybe brought, uh, they, maybe they sent some books to Paul and uh, maybe they brought uh, his coat to him and he's grateful, but he's also going to use it as a launching point to talk to them about commitment. He said, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. I'm, I'm not saying this in, 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 because I'm in need. I'm glad you sent these things. It's not because I'm overwhelmed or because I'm destitute. I, I'm not anxious. I'm not in a bad situation. Listen, I'm glad you sent these things for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances, he said. I like that idea that he learned that. It's not something that comes naturally. Paul says it took a while for me. It wasn't intuitive for me. It was something that it took me a while. It wasn't natural. I've learned to be content, to be at peace, to have a self-sufficiency. I'm learning to deal with it, to live in such a state that even though things around me are unsure, I'm not going to stress out about it. I'm not going to get overly anxious or worried about it. I'm not going to run away from it. I'm going to learn to be content with it. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm not like that. Maybe the Apostle Paul was like that. Well, no, the Apostle Paul wasn't. The Apostle Paul was not somebody who was with, without ambition. This was a guy that was a mover and a shaker. This was a guy that was always on the go. This was a guy that had a plan. The Apostle Paul wasn't apathetic. And so for him to say with that personality, I've learned to be content What Ever the circumstances is pretty significant. Paul says, my attitude is not dependent upon external circumstances. My inner peace is not dependent upon the things that are going on around me. My contentment doesn't come because of circumstances. My contentment is something that I have learned, something that I am learning. Maybe you're thinking, wouldn't, wouldn't that be nice? I'd like to be there. I'd like to be where Paul is. That would be great to be there. How does he do that? Tell me, Paul, what is it that, that does that? And what we do learn from this is that it's possible to be there. Uh, it, we may not be there yet. We may not know how to get there. But the Apostle Paul says it's possible for you to be at a place where you have learned contentment. Verse 12, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. Apostle Paul would have known what it was like. He was a prominent Pharisee. He, he knew what it was like to, to have the, the luxuries of life. But he says, I've learned not to get addicted to having a lot so that when I don't have a lot, I don't you know, miss it. I, I can't function. I, I, I've learned what it's like to have plenty. I've learned what it's like to have a lot less. And I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want, kind of repeating there, but I want to, I want to look at that phrase, I have learned the secret of being content. In fact, that, that word that we translate that phrase, learn the secret, it's actually just one word, and it is the only time that it's used in the New Testament. It becomes a 
pretty a rare and pretty significant situation right there and so it immediately gets our attention one greek word that was used often in cultic mysticism and here's what it, it kind of uh, gave the the tone of being initiated into a secret society being initiated into some secret society. You know, maybe you were a part of a sorority or a fraternity and maybe you had a special handshake and nobody else knew it was a secret. You were a part of something and only a few people knew it. Don't tell anyone this is our secret. That's kind of the idea. I have learned the mystery or I've learned the secret of being content. Paul is saying, I've been initiated into the secret knowledge of contentment. It's available to everybody, but not a lot of people really know about it. Well, what's the secret? What is it, Paul? How do you do it, Paul, when you've gone through being beaten and stoned and, and you were shipwrecked and, and, and you were jailed and you've gone through all of those things? Paul, how in the world did you get initiated into this secret uh, society of people that understand commitment? And the next verse tells us that. It's one of the most famous verses probably in the New Testament, one of the most misapplied verses, one of the verses that often gets taken out of context and it gets applied to all kinds of stuff. But I'm reminding you before we even look into it that the context is Paul's summary of how you live with contentment in your current reality situation, in your plan B situation, in the circumstances where life is chaotic for you. And for Paul, that was in prison, in a life-threatening, life may be ending, this may be it kind of a situation. How do we deal with it in that kind of situation? Well, Paul says, I can do all of this whether it's beaten or being stoned or shipwrecked or whether it's being chained to a, a guard, whether it's being stuck away from my friends without all the stuff, run out of town, whatever, I can get through all of this. I can go through all this and still follow. I can do all of this through him. Talking specifically about Jesus, about Christ right here. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. There is a mystery and that mystery is that the strength of Jesus is available to us. When you're in a current reality situation and you don't know how you're going to get through it, you don't know what you're going to do, you don't know what to do, there is a mystery, a, a secret situation. It is something that you can access when you're a part of this, when you're in that current situation, that God has his strength available to you. Now, this verse, as we talked about, often gets kind of misquoted, misapplied. It gets used in lots of different situations. It becomes often kind of a, you know, Christian rocky verse you know try to get us pumped up and get us motivated and get us excited it becomes a sports mantra for you know the christian football team and and that's not what paul intended in fact i'm probably wondering if paul's thinking to himself as it gets used and puts on posters that you know that's really not what i intended by that thing you, really you're going to use that for for that particular moment what paul is saying is I'm going to be fine on the inside, even though the world around me is out of control, that I can survive, that I can thrive, not because I'm strong, not because I can get my act together, not because I can somehow develop some inner strength, but because he gives me strength. So let's maybe kind of walk through it this way and maybe kind of reword it this way. I think Paul's saying, I can't, but he can, and he can through me. I, I can't, but he can, and he can through me. I can't, I'm not able. I, I'm not able to do that. I'm not going to pretend. I'm not going to, you know, listen to some podcast that's going to help me get you know, internally motivated. I'm not going to drum up some inner strength and motivation. I can't do that. But Jesus can. 
Jesus can do that, and I know that he can do this because he had the strength to be able to drag his own cross and be crucified on my behalf and on behalf of the world. He died for me. I know that Jesus can, but most important, he can through me. I can't, he can, but he can through me. And so maybe you're single right now. And you've tried being unsingle, and that didn't work out so well, but you're tired of trying, and you're tired of, of, of looking, and you've gone through everything, and all the options, none of those are really promising. They all just create more oppor worse opportunities. You can't, but he can through you. Maybe for you, things aren't good at home. And you drive home every day and you never know which of several different versions of your spouse is going to show up. And every time you think, I, I, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do this. And the truth is you can't. You can't, but he can through you. Or maybe your health isn't good. And the doctor just kind of, kind of shrugs his shoulders and says, you know what? We can, we can monitor it and we can, we can treat it, but... We really can't fix it. We can't cure it. And, I, you know, there, there's nothing we can do. And, and you're wondering to yourself, what can I do? What, what am I going to do with this? And through this, there's nothing you can do. You can't, but he can through you. And you found out your career isn't under your control and you're tempted to do something stupid or unethical, something you'll regret. You're anxious about your situation and you just keep thinking to yourself, what am I going to do about this? And the truth is, there's really nothing you can do. You can't, but he can through you. You may be looking at all that going, I, I don't get this. I, I don't understand what, 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 how that works, what's going on there. And Paul would say, you're right, because it's a mystery. It's a mystery to us all, but that mystery creates a contentment in your current reality circumstances. And that mystery is Christ living in me. And so I want you to say it with me. You, you probably maybe memorize this verse, maybe you've memorized it in an old version. You, you say it and whatever, but I want you to do it. All the campuses saying with me, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Let's say it again, everybody together. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Maybe, maybe for you, it needs to become kind of your mantra. Maybe that needs to become something in your current reality situation that, that you draw upon this verse and you quote this verse and it needs to become something that you say for a period of time. Being reminded of the mystery, the secret of Christ in me. The foundation of your faith is not answered prayer. Foundation of your faith is not everything going your way, not happily ever after endings. In fact, it's always a mistake to wrap our faith in God around the fulfillment of our dreams and around the answers to our prayers. Because what happens to it is when my dreams come true, then I tend to follow God and trust God and believe in God. But when my dreams don't come true, then I don't want to follow. I don't want to believe in God because he didn't, you know, meet me halfway. He didn't keep up with his end of the bargain. None of those things say anything about the presence or the activity of God. Remember that, that, that it's, it's, not the same, it's not the same thing. It, it does not equate, the, the absence of God uh, does not equate with, with God caring about me and, 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 and the adversity that we face. It doesn't equate with absence or apathy of God. So what did Paul do? Paul said, I've learned the secret. I, I've learned the secret of contentment, and this is it. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. You want the secret? This is it, Paul says. I can do all things. I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for teaching us through the words of your uh, Apostle Paul today. 
And God, we're, we're in awe of the things that he had to deal with, the, the, the adversity and difficulties that, that he had to put up with. And God, I, I'm thankful that, that we have that example of someone who remained faithful to you and someone who, who uh, looked upon you and, and followed you and even shared that for generations and centuries to come. God, we're grateful for that. And Father, I'm praying that for all of those that, that as we're listening, that you would help us to learn this secret, the secret of finding that inner peace and that self-sufficiency when things are not going as we hope they would, when things are not going as we planned, when our dreams aren't coming true, when we're in a current reality situation, God, would you help us to find the secret of content, contentment of Christ living in us, the strength that comes? I can't, but he can, and he can through me. Thank you for that promise. In Jesus' name, amen.